From an Oldsmobile Sierra just outside Brainerd, it's the IGN DigiGuys. Well, they've never done this before, but seeing as it's special circumstances and all, they can knock $100 off that true coat. Please welcome Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. Oh, that was a mouthful. Corey, who set us in that mouthful? You don't have to go far to find out that that was written by Lorenzo Rafa. Oh. Fargo. Yeah. Reference. Yeah. That's go a- far, Fargo. Yeah, we get Go it. far yourself. Yeah, that's good. Speaking, Argo. Yeah, thank you, Corey. Uh, speaking of uh, speaking of Fargo, you know, um, Kumiko, the treasure hunter, is out right now. Who? In theaters. Kumiko, the treasure hunter. Who are you? You you know about this, don't you? This better be good because you're leading the show no. with it. I don't know what you're talking well, about. Well, no, Fargo, Kumiko, the treasure hunter. It's a, it's an American independent film. It was at Sundance. I just, I just got released theatrically. Got a couple of Spirit Award nominations. You don't know this? No. Really? What is it? it okay. It, it, the guy who directed it, he and his brother, they've been doing shorts and stuff for like 10 years. It took them 10 years to raise the funding for this film. I've been wearing but shorts for years. It's, they took an urban legend. In 2001, there was a Japanese woman who uh, disappeared from her work in Tokyo and then turned up like in Minnesota dead in the snow. And she basically committed suicide. But the, the, the urban legend arose based on certain circumstances, that she was looking for the treasure from Fargo, that she thought the movie was real and that she was looking for the... Anyway, it wasn't true, but the urban legend proliferated and, and uh, these guys just decided to actually write a movie based on the urban legend. Like, what if this really kind of not socially connected Japanese woman with, in bad circumstances sort of became obsessed with the idea that the treasure in that Fargo, the movie, is actually a treasure map? And that she uses the movie as a, and she comes to the United States, and you know, it goes so to this it's whole. So it's a faux documentary, or is it a documentary? No, it's based a, on it's the a narrative film. It's a narrative, it's a narrative film. film. It's a narrative film based but on this uh, ap- this apocryphal story or this based, exactly. fable, or whatever. Yes, it is. exactly. Got it. Yeah. And That's anyway, cool. it's 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 great. The, you know, it's it's uh, Rinko Kikuchi from Babel is sure. the star. She's fantastic because she's like she's edgy but weird and freaky and kind of convincing in the whole. Because you have to buy into the fact that she believes that Fargo, that this VHS tape that she's unearthed on the beach of Fargo is in fact like was planted there as to give her a roadmap to find this treasure. You have to buy into that. And Kikuchi is, you know, she makes you believe. Well, here's the thing, though. If, yeah. if Rinko Kikuchi oh, no. had married oh, no. Colonel Clink, oh, divorced gosh. Colonel Clink, and then started dating Ringo Starr, oh. they'd be introduced as Ringo and Kinko King. You, 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 you see, you sat <laughs> you better, there. You're better at those than you I You sat there putting this together. Exactly. And then you blew it. You couldn't even. You, that, you, I did. That was for Alexander Berlika. Okay. I, I did that for him. Okay. Because he sent us an email. He did. He did. And so shout amazing. out to Alexander. Yes. Always a over shout there, out to Alexander. Over there in Belarus. Uh, anyway. Um, uh, any, yeah, I know. <laughs> what? Whatever. Okay. Do we have DVDs to, or we have, to talk we, about? We've got gobs. I, I got well, I to start. Okay, I'm going to pile through the anime. Do you want to want to time me on the anime? I By the way, can I start by saying that uh, for once Wade made me food? Yes, I did. You did? I sure did. You made me a grilled cheese sandwich. It's because my wife forced me to. See, you uh, okay, be honest. <laughs> if, if if you would not have made me a grilled I was cheese sandwich to- unless your wife had said I that. was totally focused on this. I was focused no, on the you podcast. No, you weren't focused on this. You were you were not as giving and generous I, I as your wife. I was a terrible host. I was a horrendous Your wife is a nice, I'm a bad host. A delicious grilled cheese sandwich. I'm a bad host. What can I, I, say? I make you something every week. So, um, the anyway, but I got a ton of anime here. Do you want to time me on the anime? Are you sure. Okay. Uh, how much give, you got? Give me, give me 10 minutes on the anime. Hang on. Give me 10 I'm minutes doing, on the I'm anime. Doing, I'm doing it. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, you're, are you ready? And, set, and. No, no. no. Hang on. Uh, Three, two, two. One, go. Here we go from Sente Filmworks. I feel like I'm Gary Collins and all of it. You're wasting time. Okay. Sente Filmworks. This is, of course, from Section 23, but Sente is the uh, the label. Section 23, the distributor. Um, Gingetsune, Messenger Fox of the Gods, the complete collection. Man, anime just gets comes up with some really bizarre concepts. Uh, this whole thing... Kind of centers around, uh, I mean, obviously there's some mythical, you know, Shinto stuff in this, but this basically centers around uh, this uh, girl who can communicate with spirits 
and this kind of fox-like god who is who she communicates with, who has protected this shrine. Anyway, it's it. I, I'm sure it means a lot more if you're Japanese, but it, the animation's cool and it's all perfectly fine. Space Brothers. Uh, this is a two-disc set, episodes one through thirteen. This is the first collection of Space Brothers. I, I have heard from anime people that this is long overdue, so I'll take their word for it. Uh, actually, takes place in 2006 in, in the past. Uh, and and then there's a there's a with these two young brothers, and there's a there's a UFO incident which then results in us flashing forward to 2025, where they're adults. And I won't divulge any of this, but it's there's a whole it's a it's a whole near future space travel kind of thing that feels like it should have been anyway. Never mind. It's okay. It ain't great. Uh, Diabolic Lovers, the complete collection, is unbelievably cool animation. This is this is totally like you know uh, the the whole Japanese kind of rock and roll hipster punk quasi vampire dyed hair look thing that we've come to associate with Japanese youth. That that uh, sensibility is all over this thing. Uh, Diabolic Lovers is uh, somewhat uh, impossible to penetrate from a narrative standpoint, but the whole Japanese vampire thing, good for the artwork. Tiger and Bunny, The Rising. Uh, this is a feature film of Tiger and Bunny. If you follow this, it's a little, it's it's uh, kind of somewhere between a Marvel comic and uh, the uh, Power Rangers and uh, Transformers. And I, it's, it, you know, that's from Warner Brothers. Looks awesome. I, but again, narratively impenetrable. Uh, Log Horizon Collection Two. This is also a Sente release through Section Twenty Three. Uh, this is this is a a mystical magical narrative that uh, centers around the World Fraction spell, and uh, it is um, it's okay. Um, Golden Time Collection Two. Uh, it's a little, this is this is one of those kind of Japanese youth things. Set, you know, around college kid age, it didn't really work for me. Didn't watch a whole lot of it. Uh, much more freaky is Hazuki's Cool Headedness, com- the complete collection. Uh, man, this is just completely from from Mars. This thing is totally off the wall. Uh, it's a little bit like if you took a samurai, uh, one of those samurai animes, and you superimposed uh, a, a Pokemon on it. Does that make sense? Not to how, me, but how far? Well, how far in am I? Uh, you've got uh, you. You've still got about uh, six and a half minutes. Oh, that's good. Okay. Uh, we also have. Uh, let's see. And uh, no, I'm going to skip that one. Uh, Ranma. This is Ranma is really great. Um, this is 23 restored episodes. First time on Blu-ray now. This is uh, Ranma and a half. Um, pretty uh, pretty great stuff. This is the, the fourth set in uh, this ongoing thing. And uh, Ranma is like really classic anime. It's just really, really classic anime. It is a whole kind of uh, martial arts thing uh, with lots of classic Japanese extreme art from the, the golden era of anime. And uh, I, you know, this is, this is just one of these really cool releases that uh, we get from Viz. And it's, it's neat. I think it's cool. Uh, Sailor Moon. If you don't know what Sailor Moon is, you got no business uh, even being an anime fan. The, 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 all the, look at those pixies! Come on, tell me that's not. It's like it's like Josie and the Pussycats for anime fans. It's great. It is. Look, I mean, they all the little cute outfits and the hair. It's kind of perverse in a way that we enjoy that artwork of, of those girls. Uh, let's see. No, we're going to skip that. We got some Disney stuff. A lot of Studio Ghibli stuff's been coming out from Disney, and uh, we now have three of the very best: Tales from Earthsea. Uh, Pompoco and Porco Rosso, of course, with uh, all of the uh, the uh, replaced English language voices, classic Miyazaki stuff. Michael Keaton, Carrie Elwes, uh, Brad Garrett, David Ogden Steers, an amazing voice uh, cast for Porco Rosso, totally works. Uh, Pompoco, a little less accessible, but uh, this is directed by Isao Takahata, who, of course, is not quite uh, on the level of Miyazaki, but close enough. And Tales from Earthsea, uh, directed by Goro Miyazaki. Uh, beautiful, visually just absolutely stunning. The uh, you know the, the the voice work, Cheech Marin doesn't quite uh, work, but uh, Timothy Dalton works perfectly. There is a new 25th anniversary edition of Ghost in a Shell, Mark's favorite. 
Mark doesn't understand what this is about, and neither do I. But you know what? I don't understand that. I don't understand Akira. I understand none of that stuff. Akira, yeah. there's like this big blobby monster at the end, and everybody gets eaten by the blobby monster in the stadium, and I'm just confused. Yeah, but it's it's cool. It's got a lot of bleeps and beeps, and and it's it's cool. It's a whole. It's 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 one of the great all time animes. The artwork is still classic. Oh, the artwork's and, great. The story, I didn't get it. Yeah, well, they're they're making. Aren't they aren't they doing a uh, feature live action? For a hundred million years, they've been wanting to do a feature oh, version. I think uh, Keanu Reeves was attached for a while. And yeah, well, whatever. Uh, here's here's a great one. Space Dandy. Come on, give it up. This is uh, from Funimation, uh, originally in the Bandai Library, and uh, <laughs> come on, Mark, give it up. <laughs> It's what's like the, John what, Travolta in Greece, maybe? What's the ta- what's the tagline? Bright, colorful, and chaotic. No, no, no. The tagline right there. He's a dandy guy in space. I don't think they know it's exactly the what, what dandy. They well, have no idea. dandy has another connotation. They've got no idea. It's 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 funny. It's funny as hell. Anyway, yeah, you know, it's it's true. It's kind of like John Travolta from Greece in space uh, with this friggin' weird cat, and it's it, it, you know what it, it is. It's exactly what it is. It's it's just the Japanese took their whole kind of uh, uh, 50s greaser bebop obsession and superimposed it on anime science fiction, and you get this just weird hybrid. Uh, Student Council's Discretion is another one of those Japanese school... This is a complete collection, also from Sente. One of those Japanese schoolgirl obsessions. Very odd. Kind of creepy. Uh, same thing with Outbreak Company. This is just, it, it gets a little too baby doll at a certain point. Um, Rydeen is something that I grew up with, and we've got some great, this is more recent Rydeen, uh, Collection 1, Collection 2. Those are both only on DVD, not on Blu-ray, which is a bit of a pity. But um, uh, Rydeen is, 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 a, is narratively really a classic story. Got a Pokemon here, uh, Pokemon the movie, uh, the uh, Diancy and the Cocoon of Destruction. I still don't really understand the world of Pokemon. I have tried to. I've had children try to explain it to me. Never really works. And how much time do I have left, Mark? Let's see. You've got two minutes and 20 seconds. Okay, here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into a couple of great, really Funimation titles here. Uh, this thing is fantastic. Um, Unbreakable Machine Doll. What do you think of that, Mark? Unbreakable Machine Doll. It's, it's self-explanatory. That's what I think of it. That's right. Like all these titles, you kind of go, sounds cool. Don't know what that means. Uh, so anyway, this is, a, uh, this is a complete series. This is a uh, six-volume set. And uh, one of the, some of the most impressive, relatively recent animation I have seen. Uh, there's about six hours worth of stuff here. And uh, it's... Boy, how do you even? Uh, it, th- th- there are the battle scenes in this thing are just breathtaking. Um, it's uh, it's it's kind of cyberpunky, um, but again, it's just it's it's fantastic artwork. And uh, Tokyo Ravens is also amazing artwork. This is like state of the art stuff. Um, th- this is also about six hours long, and uh, you know, it, it it's just even if you don't know what's going on, it will blow your mind. Um, this gets into this kind of uh, modern day clan orientation stuff, you know, the the ancient superimposed on the present, and uh, you know, very strange mystical legends that that, that, that uh, you know come to life in the present. It's pretty cool stuff. Um, let's see what else I got here. Uh, how much time left? No, I'm not telling you. It's supposed to be a surprise. Okay, uh, another fairy tale. This is volume fifteen of fairy tale. T A I L. Hence the, the pun of the title. This is a Blu-ray DVD combo pack, as they all are. Um, I, uh, I, this kind of wore thin on me around, like, I don't know, volume four. So uh, this, obviously, you have to be a, a really, really hardcore fan to follow this ongoing epic as it just never, ever ends. But, um, it, it, you know, they, they, it has a following. It's one of the strongest out there. Fairy tale is, is a big deal. And then Harlock, Space Pirate. Uh, this includes the original Japanese version as well as the English language version. And um, uh, this also, I believe, has been in the, uh, the live action cooker for quite a while. Um, they put a quote by James Cameron on the cover of this, and uh, I think that's because Cameron was trying to develop this for a while. Oh, there we go. I nailed it. I nailed it. I no. Got it. Did not nail it. Yeah, I, I, I kind of nailed it. Anyway, uh, so this is, of course, uh, you know, as you might imagine, Harlock is a, uh, it's a little bit like, uh, oh gosh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean cross with Avatar. 
I don't know, in some sense, kind of, you know, it's one of those space going sagas, a little bit like Star Blazers, but it's got a whole kind of piratey thing superimposed on it, which the Japanese also have a bit of a fixation on. So, uh, anyway, really, really well directed. Hinji Aramaki, not to be confused with Greg Araki, uh, does a really great job. Fantastic animation, really, really cool. And, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's very much a kind of a space cruiser, Yamato, Star Blazers sensibility, but it, you know, you mix it up with that whole swashbucklery thing. And uh, there it wait, is. Wait, wait, swashbuggery? Swashbuggery. Oh, my gosh, we invented <laughs> a new swashbuggery. concept. Swashbuggery. No. Do not get caught alone with those pirates. All right, so... What else we have? Do you have any news? Well, here's some news. Yeah. May 8th, Wade. Fifty Shades of Grey unrated. Oh, my goodness. Let me tell you something. Unrated? <laughs> really? Yes. Because I'll tell you, that PG-13 rated version that they released, it's... No, let me tell you something. I mean, if, if they had any guts, which they don't, they would make that unrated version basically porn. You know, look. Uh, now, Fifty Shades, not a good movie. You know, I, I, I have it was no. Here's the thing with Fifty Shades. It was just good enough where you thought to yourself... This is kind of a, this needs to be evaluated as a real movie, as opposed to just a bunch of camp. But yeah. it's just not very good. Well, you know why? Because you you can't make like Last Tango in Paris anymore. You can't make just just like real smoldering eroticism anymore. No, you know, and that's what this needed to be. So maybe the unrated stuff will just show more whipping and yeah. Spanking. Who the hell knows? And then uh, what else do we have? Apollo 13, 20th anniversary coming out. June 2nd. Pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Right? It's up for Best Picture. Yeah. Come on. Tom yeah. Hanks, Ed Harris, Kevin Bacon. Can't beat that. Also, uh, one of my own personal favorites, Mississippi Burning, is finally coming out, by the way. I think Twilight Time is doing it in the U.S. Second Sight is doing it uh, in the U.K. But I will definitely pick up uh, Mississippi Burning. And, of course, uh, Interstellar is coming out a couple of weeks. Yep. Right? Actually, actually, next week. Next week? Yep. We don't have it yet, do we? We do. We do? We do. We talk about it today? Uh, no, we're talking about it next week. Oh. Well, that's not fair. Oh, well, we have to, it, we have know, to watch it. it. Yes. Uh, <laughs> it's, not, it's not the same as seeing it in IMAX. Let's put it that way. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, Mississippi Burning. Wow. I, I, I uh, love that movie. I had no idea. And by the way, I understand that that movie is one in a very long tradition of movies where like the noble white man saves yeah. the, the, the poor defenseless uh, black person. Yeah. And which is like in itself a bit insulting, but I still love the movie. I still do too. I think it's great. And and let's remember that movie was at one point the runaway front runner to win Best Picture sure. until everybody started making oh, it distorts history. It makes the white guy. And they really they it, it's unfortunate because Alan Parker could have had his moment in the sun, but instead it went to Rain Man. But Alan Parker, he that was part of his amazing run. I mean, oh. that guy movie after movie after movie was great. He, you know, Alan Parker came out of the gate very strong with Bugsy Malone, but that was not the moment. The moment when you suddenly were like, holy cow, Alan Parker is the man. That was Midnight Express. Sure. And from Midnight Express, right up through Mississippi Burning, pretty much. And fame. It, it, you had fame in there. You had Fame Bur- is nominated for like four Oscars. I know. You had Birdie, which nearly so won the good. Palme d'Or at the, at the, at the uh, at Cannes Film Festival. Birdie was the runner-up that year to Tarkovsky's The Sacrifice. And, uh, you know, Birdie is, uh, for me, it's, it's far and away his best film. You had Angel Heart. Oh, I love I mean, Angel Heart. Good grief. Come it's on, just, Lewis Cipher? And, and frankly, I, my favorite film of the year uh, that year, not that year, but a later year, was Evita. Evita was my number one film of the year that it came out. That's good I thought know. he just killed it with Evita. And, That's you know, The Wall? Come on. The Wall. Oh, Alan Parker. I know. Then, Why don't then, they let then, it? Then he kind of like, whereas guys like Mike Lee and those other, they sort of carved out a little bit of a socio-political niche yeah. in their world. You know, they kept making movies. They were all really good. Yeah. Ken Loach, he just kind of kept doing his thing. Yeah. Alan Parker, he just disappeared. Well, he, he still has some projects he's trying to get done, but uh, Angela's Ashes was sort of like Terry his last. Terry Gilliam. But, but the, the, what really put Alan, and this is totally off topic, what really put uh, Alan Parker on his heels was the, uh, the Kevin Spacey thing, the... Um, uh, the, the 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 yeah the the, uh, the 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 led the the story of blah 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 where Kevin Spacey is the teacher and he dies and did he did he did he kill himself did he fake a suicide that whole thing really did, oh the the, 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 the uh, something don't of, stop the recording the something of David something what was that the life life and times of David Gale that's it <laughs> that was it I don't even know that I don't know. <laughs> Life of David. I think, it was, I think it was just the life of David Gale, wasn't it? Life, I don't know. I pulled I the whole thing out of my ass. I had yeah. no idea that I had not thought about that movie since it came out. Well, see, that's the problem. Nobody else did. It, was, it okay, had wait. a great cast, right? I mean, Kevin Spacey and Kate Kate uh, 
Kate Winslet, but it just didn't. Kevin Spacey. It, Kate went, no, it went nowhere, and it just made people like, ah, he's old. Kate Hepburn, Kate Blanchett, Kate a lot, of, a lot of Kates in the movies. <laughs> okay, wait, here's the thing. Yes. As we move on to our, uh, new Blu-rays. Yes. Reading in the paper. Yes. Because I, I, I read. I know you think I'm, a, I'm illiterate, but I, I do read. Yeah. Force Majeure, one of the best foreign films of last year. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. Domestic uh, remake rights snapped up. Snapped oh, up, Wade. Frick, you know. Is now going to be potentially an re- American remake of Force Majeure. Truly, no. Now, why, Just, why do I tell you this? Uh, you wanna, do you want to know who snapped up those rights? You will never guess. I'm sure you know. Who? In a billion years. Who snapped up those rights? Who snapped up those rights? Are you rights? ready? I'm ready. Julia Louis Dreyfus. Is that not impossible? How did Julia? It, it it shows you how little faith any American studio has, or mini major has in that material. That Julia Louis Dreyfus, a comedic actress, who like has been in like two films in her yeah. whole life, yeah. would actually be able to snap up the American the, the domestic I remake know. rights to Force Majeure. Is that just bizarre? It's weird. It's and, weird. And she would star in it and produce it. They shouldn't be remaking it anyway, but whatever. Well, no, you, it, it, you can yeah. remake it, but it, now, now it's got to be a it's going to be a forty million dollar. It's, it's like a mid budgeted thing. Yeah. It can't be. It's not going to be one hundred and fifty million dollars. But I now have no faith in it. However, no, I, I do was... have faith in Julie Weed Dreyfus in Veep. Yeah, she won an Emmy Award. And this show has lasted longer than I. I let, let me put it this way: this is this has hung on longer and done better than I ever imagined it would. I don't. I know. I don't really. I don't see it. I mean, it has a kind of a cool cast, but uh, and the thing is that the guy who the guy who uh, created it is the guy who did in the loop. Yeah. Right. What's his name? Ianucci. And who, in the loop is hilarious. I love that film. Yeah, not so much. But this is not. At, you you like in the loop? Yeah. Oh, it's, so funny. Are you yeah. kidding me? Not, well, yeah. it, that, that's what brought Peter Capaldi to a lot of people's I know. Uh, awareness. I know. Love that movie. He did create this. It's not as wicked to me. It's not as wicked as In the Loop. Who would have thought that of the cast on Seinfeld, yeah. that Julia Louis-Dreyfus would be the one to go on to anchor another show? Yeah, but you know what, though? Here's the thing. She did a lot of crappy sitcoms. That just it came. Oh, no, I know. She, I know. Her, her uh, hit and miss ratio was not in her favor. No, it's not. But it's just, it's, I would not have pegged her to have another hit show after that. Right. I just wouldn't have. I wouldn't have. So. You would, Michael Richards, the guy, he, I, he goes on stage and within 15 seconds, his story's over. Career. Yeah. Anyway, anyway, Veep Season 3. Yeah. On the Blu-ray. Also, we have uh, Silicon Valley, the complete first season. This is uh, from Mike Judge. You know, I love Mike Judge. And, uh, although I, I, and I find this um, environment pretty funny, and I find some of the comments it has to make about Silicon Valley and that whole thing pretty funny. Um, but I don't know if this thing is really taking off for me. I wish it was a little bit more, a little bit more satirical, a little bit more pointed, a little bit, more, uh, a little bit, more, a little bit tougher on the Silicon Valley aesthetic. Um, but people do kind of like it. It's a bit bubbly under the radar. It's not one of HBO's big shows, but still, it's uh, it's it's pushing the rock up the hill. Um, funny, good stuff. Always always love Mike Judge. I, I want um, Idiocracy on Blu-ray. Wait, make right, totally. Make Idiocracy on Blu-ray. Yeah, okay. Uh, you know, the, the, this show it's okay. It's okay. It's not it's not unfunny, but I feel like there's a lot more it needs to say about that whole culture. That's not on the nose. Like a lot of what I say about the culture is kind of on the nose. I wish it dug a little bit deeper. Is it not? Is it? Is it? Uh, is it not as office spacey as it should be? Or is it too office spacey? It took me a while to get. You know what? Can I? Can I admit something? Yeah. When I first saw Office Space, I didn't get it. Oh, it's the best. Because I don't. I, I've never worked in that environment. Neither have I. And then over the years, I thought it was really funny. It's just so funny. It's so funny. I burned I burn the whole thing down. All right. It's great. Know. All right, uh, on DVD, unfortunately, is Pee Wee's Playhouse seasons three, four, and five. I like how they're just packaging random seasons three, four, and five. Yeah, well, they they released the whole thing last year, and uh, you know now they're now they're just trying to milk it. Now Pee Wee, by the way, has a uh, has a uh, he's got a uh, movie coming. He's got a thing for Netflix. Lawrence Fishburne, his proudest moment. Mm-hmm. Hey, Pee Wee. Jeez. Uh, how, do you, little, how do you how, yes. how, you know how do you live that down? I don't know. Mortal Kombat. There was a Mortal Kombat uh, a series. This was in uh, 98, 99. Gosh, yeah. And Man, here it, was it bad. is. Huh? 
man, that was a bad show. If you if you remade this show today, it would be so much more badass. Yes, I feel like like would be. everyone knows like parkour and hardcore kung fu. Yeah. Everyone's a little more versed in that yep. stuff. Like the Matrix made that sort of martial arts thing really cool to American audiences. You could really. If you remade that show, you could really kick it and knock it out of the park. True. But Mortal Kombat Conquest uh, is basically uh, terrible. But all the characters are there from the video game, and that's all that matters. I guess. Any celebrity sightings this week, by the way, for you? Have you any, any names you can drop? I'm just curious. I did see Elizabeth Berkeley at Earth Cafe. Oh, did you? I didn't. Oh, you you, now, why would you have never asked me that? Not, not that not Elizabeth enough. Berkeley is a big name, but you've never asked me that, and yet yeah. I happened to see. Elizabeth Berkeley at Earth Cafe. Yeah. And I wasn't sure. Okay, here's, okay, this, here's what annoys me. <laughs> so you go to a restaurant, right? And this really only happens to me with women, like female celebrities. Yeah. So you go to a restaurant. You're sitting there. You see a pretty girl. And you think you might know her from something, right? Mm-hmm. Maybe you know her personally. Sure. You went to school together. Maybe it's a celebrity. You're just not quite sure. And you keep looking at her. I, 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 I had the same experience with Katie Holmes. Mm-hmm. This is like literally like 15 years ago. You're looking at them mm-hmm. because they're pretty. And only after you realize, oh, my God, that was Elizabeth Berkeley, or, oh, my God, that was Katie Holmes, now you think they probably think you were staring at them because you're a celebrity and I'm just like a weird stalker guy. When actually I'm staring at them because I can't quite place their face and I think I might have gone to high school with them, <laughs> but also they might be a celebrity. And I always feel... A little uncomfortable during there those moments because I'm staring at this woman because she's very pretty, and then she's looking at me because I'm looking at her. But she thinks I'm looking at her because she's Elizabeth Berkeley. I'm looking at her because she's a pretty girl, and that's it. You're creepy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So the only reason why I knew it wound up being Elizabeth Berkeley is because when she was leaving, she somebody said hi to her, hi. some friend, and she said hi, I'm Elizabeth. So she said, I'm Elizabeth. So, oh, that's Elizabeth Berkeley. The point being... I'm so sorry I asked Is that... I don't... I, 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 the same thing happened with Katie Holmes. I'm just, you know, remember Babalu, a restaurant on Montana in 9th? It's gone now. Yeah, no. You don't remember Babalu restaurant? Yeah, no. Okay. So there's a restaurant called Babalu okay. on Montana in Santa Monica. Mm-hmm. Long gone. So uh, at the bakery, there was this beautiful girl, about, you know, 30 feet away, whatever it was. And I'm looking at it. I go, God, that's a beautiful girl. And she's looking at me. And, I'm, and I, I don't think she was looking at me because she thought I was handsome. She was looking at me because she was probably going to call the police. <laughs> but she's looking at me, and I'm looking at God, that's a beautiful girl. And then it winds up being Katie Holmes. Mm. And now I feel like an idiot because I think that Katie was looking at me thinking, why is that weird, creepy stalker fan staring at me? But I'm just looking at her going, she's pretty. I didn't know it was Katie Holmes. That happens a lot to me, I guess. You should move on. To all of our listeners, I, <laughs> I apologize. I, 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 I had no idea. You can no see the idea. dilemma. You can see the dilemma. Yes, oh, I sure can. I, I can indeed. So uh, some interesting docs this week to make mention of. Putin's Way. This is a front line. Well, oh, there's PBS. only one way. Actually, it's a very short documentary. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, this is actually really interesting because it's, it's essentially the backstory on Putin. I don't think most of us really understand. I mean, we're all like, yeah, he's a former KGB guy and he now runs Russia and he's like a quasi-dictator. You don't. You don't. Quasi? You're pretty much dictator. <laughs> Although he does ride horseback uh, uh, without a shirt on. It is. Uh, it is fascinating, and it gets into all kinds of. I mean, this gets into stuff you had no idea, uh, the, like these these unsolved bombings from 1999. There's a, there's a lot of really uh, really interesting backstory stuff on this. This guy is, you know, he nearly killed me. You know that. I've talked about this before. No, so that, that, that he whole, didn't nearly kill you. He, yeah, he you did. You wish he did. I was there you in London awesome. eating in that same vicinity when that whole polonium poisoning episode happened. Uh, it, it, also from PBS, Nature's Owl Power. My daughter loves owls. And it may be, be I, mean, I mean, I can't wait to show her Twin Peaks. Cause Who loves owls? My daughter. Who loves owls? My daughter. Oh, the, I, I get it. Oh, that was cute. Because that's what owls say. Of course, owls also figure prominently in Twin Peaks, which, by the way, turns now we're having problems with the Twin Peaks on Showtime. You, but you following this? I'm not. Because David Lynch's contract is not firm. So Ooh. suddenly it's like, oh, everybody thought we had all the T's crossed, all the I's dotted. Oh, and now David wants something. Oh, I wonder. Now that was for Showtime, right? Yeah. I wonder if Showtime leaked the story. So that people would get excited about it, and then David would feel obligated to do it because he no, knew how excited they people had were. A whole, they had a whole announcement, like a public thing, and he was there, and it was a whole schmear. Anyway, 
Uh, no, owls uh, are cool, and owl power gets into the whole. It 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 just it, it's a wonderful profile of these incredibly cool birds, Next. and uh, it, you, who are kind of Ooh. mystifying in a certain way. No, I mean they're, they're you know they're the only bird of prey that hangs out at night, right? You know, normally bird of prey, okay, buzzards and. You know, eagles Where do and birds hawks. Sleep? Where do birds sleep? Do they like go to a bed or? A, or they, they sit like... on the branch. They sit upright and they sleep. And they close their eyes and sleep. They close their eyes and sleep. Do they dream. It's I, of course. Do androids dream of electric sheep? I don't know. Uh, and then from Nova, a PBS release, uh, Building Wonders, which is, you know, the uh, just this fantastic, wonderful look at three extraordinary uh, architectural wonders, uh, the Colosseum in Rome. A friend of ours is in Italy again. Now, what is that about? Okay, Shout okay, out to Mark. Can, Shout wait. out to Mark Sanderson. Uh, now, can, can we just uh, digress for 35 yeah. seconds? Uh, let me just say, Colosseum in Rome, the Hagia Sophia, which is in Turkey, in Istanbul, and uh, Petra, the rock formation is Petra, right? It's like... Totally cool. And Ancient, no cares. It's okay. just amazing. Last time I saw Mark yes. was at the Rise of the Planet of the Apes premiere yeah. at the Paramount lot. That's right. And he told me and all of us yeah. that he uh, had met somebody. Yeah. I'm very happy for him. Yeah. And, but she lives in Italy. Yes. And this is a very, very long distance relationship. Yeah. Extremely long. Los mm-hmm. Angeles to Rome, wherever she lives yeah. in Italy. Yeah. And yet he's on Facebook all the time posting beautiful photos of himself and his beautiful yeah. girlfriend. Yeah. And uh, it's very strange. Why is it strange? I don't know. Wonderful yet strange. Okay. I don't know. I mean, he goes to. I mean, he goes to Italy. He's, all the he's time. posting pictures of Florence. Just be great, grateful for that. You get to see pictures of Florence. I've never been to Florence. I well, that's why you should be grateful to see pictures of it. Thank you, Mark. Okay. So anyway, uh, yeah, three really cool uh, episodes here uh, on the Coliseum on the uh, the stone. You know, stone. Where did they meet, by the way? I can't remember. I have no idea. Anyway, the the stone facade of uh, of Petra. The whole kind of, you know, city, stone city of Petra. And the, the Hagia Sophia, which is, the Hagia Sophia for me is the, is the best of these. And I just have a personal, you know, affection for Istanbul. I keep meaning to go to Turkey. Can't seem to ever get there. I will do it one day. And then we have a couple of uh, really great uh, releases from Athena, which is the, uh, a, the educational line from Acorn. Uh, the story of women and art which is a special focus on female artists through the centuries, which is awesome because there are, not, there are a lot of them. And uh, so the courtesy of uh, British uh, uh, journalist Amanda Vickery, um, who, you know, teaches and, uh, you know, writes a lot on all this stuff. She, you probably, you've probably seen her on, on – uh, she does BBC radio stuff and she writes for The Guardian. Um, there's, uh, she, she takes you through this tour of the great women of art who sort of get lost among uh, a lot of the other men. And it's not just people like Georgia O'Keeffe. You get artists I've never even heard of. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Virgie Lebrun, uh, Berta Morisot, Judith Leister. I mean, it's really interesting. And, of course, most importantly, she talks about Artemisia. Did you ever see the film Artemisia, the Miramax film? No. Fantastic story. Fantastic story. Anyway, Artemisia, big part of this story as well. And the other one from Athena is Understanding Art, Baroque and Rococo. What I think is cool about Rococo, you know the beautiful thing about Rococo? It, it, will this be a chocolate joke? No. No, no, there's no joke here. This is serious. Baroque and Rococo, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a very specific uh, style of art, very specific period. And, uh, you know, the guy who hosts this is Valdemar Janaschak, who's... Uh, Voldemort? The, who is the, he's the art critic for the uh, Sunday Times in the UK. And he's, he's just a great personality. He knows everything there is to know about this stuff. He visits St. Paul's Cathedral and uh, Versailles and all kinds of, you know, all the locations in Europe that are, that are from the Baroque and the Rococo period. But Rococo is also the style of art that influenced all of the early movie palaces in Los Angeles in the 1920s. I did not know that. Yep. And By the way, now, are those, all those palaces on Broadway yep, in all, downtown LA that are like that's completely all, disres, disrepair where a bunch of homeless people is yeah, sleeping in the, yeah, in the they, foyer? They and the, look like they're actually older than the, than the original Rococo stuff in Europe because Europe takes care of their Rococo stuff. Here it's like, ah, maybe we can use that for a swap meet. <laughs> it's true. That's what we do. And now, okay, tear it down, put up a bank. It's the, we're horrible. We have just no anyway. LA has no sense of its history. None whatsoever. So anyway, uh, Mark, let's uh, let's get into some uh, all of film stuff. Let's talk about all of films. They've got a bunch of really really cool uh, catalog releases this week. I'll let you start. Why? Uh, there's been lots of uh, uh, takes and tales about um, Sherlock Holmes and Doctor Watson, and one of the more overlooked ones, and yet one of the more enjoyable ones, was without a clue. Come on. So, I actually really enjoy this movie. This is a fun movie. It's a great movie. It's a. It's just. It's a great pairing. It's a fun film. It's okay, a nice Michael Caine, 
Ben Kingsley. Now, this is Ben Kingsley before he became, you know, like a little bit. Uh, he started doing, you know, Uwe Boll movies and yeah. uh, video game adaptations and whatever yep. he does. Um, Michael Caine, Ben Kingsley, really super cool. Um, and uh, you know what happened is that uh, Doctor Watson, he's created this character of fiction called Sherlock Holmes and solving crimes. And when everybody wants to see this Holmes that he's been talking about all these years because people think he's real, he's got to figure out a way to make Sherlock Holmes come to life. And so he hires this unemployed actor played by uh, Michael Caine to portray Sherlock Such Holmes. A gr- it's a great idea. And it's great. It's, it's fantastic. Great. I really enjoy Without a Clue. It's uh, overlooked, but of course, all of films is very good at taking some of these older films um, out, of, out of the library Blowing the dust off and uh, putting them on Blu-ray. That's no great. extras. And uh, the transfer is uh, it's clean. It's okay. But uh, I just think you guys, if you decide you want to see another Sherlock Holmes type tale that I guarantee you I've never seen or heard of. Henry Mancini music, by the way. Um, Good stuff. Not a clue. Love this movie. Yep. By the way, what do you think of the, uh, the, new, Sher- the new Sherlock Holmes movie that's, that's come well, the... You know the one with. Uh, Don't they have? Uh, didn't uh, did Robert Downey Jr. play Sherlock Holmes? No, 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 no. There's a there's a whole different one that's coming out where um, uh, Gandalf slash Magneto becomes Sherlock Holmes. Yeah, well, hang on, you're not following, are you? Uh, is this a joke? No. Is it a... No. Uh, oh my gosh! I can't believe you, you. What is it? Tell me what it is. No, it's Sherlock Holmes as an old man. Oh, that's the one with uh, yes, with Ian McKellen. Yes. I've not seen that's that. That's why... You didn't, you, <laughs> I heard you, of it, though. You didn't, I you didn't, you didn't follow my Gandalf no, Magneto. I, I thought there was a joke coming. Much no, like I my... Mean, it's not a cool... Not a, not if a cool Ringo com- Kikuchi marries no, Colonel no, Clink... No, 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 no. I'm just and saying... And then dates Ringo Starr. Her name is Ringo Kinko Clink. It's cool that he is playing <laughs> all of the... Like, how, how many... How, I mean... After a lifetime, he becomes an old man, and now he plays three of the most iconic figures of all time. He's Magneto, Gandalf, and Sherlock Holmes. Come on! That is cool. It's great. I, 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 it's I'm with you. I'm with you. Uh, you know, there's a really great film from the uh, Marish Corporation uh, that they did with Blake Edwards. They did a lot of stuff with Blake Edwards. And uh, this is like one of the most underrated Blake Edwards and Marish films of their entire collaboration from 1966. What Did You Do in the War, Daddy? I love this movie. This movie is fantastic. This is such a gift, and I don't know why it doesn't get, it doesn't get more love. Um, beautiful widescreen cinematography. Pretty pretty good transfer. Um, I mean, the elements maybe aren't in the best condition. Uh, so I, I think, you know, Olive did the best they could with what they got from MGM. But um, it's a really fun film. So I hope it gets a proper restoration or a proper mastering at some point down the line. But for the time being, this is likely to, to be what we have to live with for a very long time. And it's perfectly fine. Uh, James Coburn. Uh, Aldo Ray, Giovanna Raleigh, Sergio Fantoni, and the immortal, the memorable, the one and only Dick Sean. <laughs> you love the, Dick Sean. I just can't get enough of Dick Sean. He's just the best. He is. He's still around, isn't he? No, Dick Sean died. Don't you remember? He died like 20 years ago. Oh. In a performance, he was on stage, and he collapsed. Really? And everyone started cracking up because they just thought this was like part of the shtick. Oh, and then yeah. they, they were like, oh, my gosh, he's not moving. It's not part of the shtick. And it turns out he just – he was out there doing his usual – doing his just whole weird shtick. And he just dropped dead, massive heart attack, well, dead on the spot. Did not know that. Horrible. But what a way to go, performing. That's what, would you expect anything less of Dick Sean? I would not. Those red shorts, man. Hi, mad, me. mad, mad, mad world. Jaime. He wasn't Jaime. Who was Jaime? No, Dick Gautier was Jaime. Dick Gautier was Jaime. Damn. Dick Sean's the best. <laughs> yeah, they're both dicks. You know. Oh, they're not. They're nice people. Anyway, uh, also great Henry Mancini music here as well. And uh, this is just a, it's a fantastic film. I mean, basically, it's a, it's a World War II thing and a bunch of Americans who are in Sicily. And, uh, you know, it just it becomes almost, I don't want to say it's MASH-like, but it's, it's just darn funny. It's a really fun film. So what did you do in The War Daddy? Uh, also, a couple others really quickly. Uh, the Strange Affair of Uncle Harry. A Robert Syad mock uh, kind of... Joint. It's, uh, it is, it is a, it's, a, uh, it's not really a noir. Syad mock was a, was a bit of a noir guy. Uh, this isn't noir. This is um, more of a, more of a kind of darkish family drama 
Um, but it's got a few noir elements to it. That's actually a pretty good film. Uh, it's worth watching, maybe more of a rental or anything else. And uh, Stranger at My Door, which is uh, something... I'm, I'm kind of fascinated that Olive picked this up. This is from the Paramount Library. This is not an MGM title. Uh, this is from 1956. A, a really fascinating, gritty, gritty crime film, kind of noirish. But uh, McDonald Carey has never been better. He is just really fantastic in this. And it's directed by William Whitney, who I am otherwise completely unfamiliar with. So this is a nice discovery from 1956. Yay. Wait, there was a song by Arlo Guthrie many years ago called Alice's Restaurant. The song's like 18 minutes long. Yeah, which, I, which is like 10 minutes from where I live. Uh, oh, the original. Restaurant, yeah. The original, yeah. It doesn't exist anymore, but yeah, it's where it was. Now, if you add about an hour and a half to that 18 minute song, you get a movie. There you go. Called Alice's Restaurant, directed by Arthur Penn, who, of course, directed Bonnie and Clyde. And uh, this is definitely a time capsule movie. It is a movie of its time. It is uh, charming, and it's, uh, you know, it's definitely a movie that, that tries to encapsulate its generation, which can be a little bit. Um, that could be a recipe for failure when you're trying to make a movie that's trying to encapsulate the ethos and the morals of a whole generation. And it knows that going in. But somehow this thing winds up pretty it being it's pretty charming, very anti-establishment. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of a shaggy dog movie. It's, uh, it's off-key, off-beat, but uh, I kind of like it. You know, it stars uh, Guthrie and uh, a bunch of other folks, including um, Pete Seeger, plays himself. So it's good. It's a real – you know what? It's a real counter – if you want to get a, a – a, it reminds me of Nashville, actually. But I don't know why. I always think of Nashville when it, I think of I, I agree. I, I do too. Um, when uh, – if you want to get a sense of maybe what your parents, maybe even your grandparents, um, what their generation was like in the 60s, what they were going through, Alice's Restaurant is a good, uh, good enjoyable, fun, offbeat, quirky uh, primer on what your parents went through. Totally concur. Totally concur. Also, we have um, Alan Quartermain. And the Lost City of Gold. Now, uh, this is one of those uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark knockoffs that you started to see a lot of. It's a canon thing, right? It's a canon thing. It yeah. came out in 87. Uh, all these movies were terrible. It starred... Um, <laughs> Richard Chamberlain. It starred Richard Chamberlain. Although it did have Sharon Stone. And back then, Sharon Stone was kind of young and hot. Um, and it had James Earl Jones, of course, uh, Darth Vader himself. So, um, yeah. Alan Quartermain... Uh, I would really pass on this. Again, it's a Canon film, Golden Globus. By the way, I never saw either of the Golden Globus uh, documentaries. Did you? No. The Go-Go Boys no. or the other one? No. I would love, how could you not be begging to see that? I, uh, do, do I have to? <laughs> Come on. They okay. were the best. Yeah, all right. Okay. <laughs> Look at you. Yeah. Anyway, the Alan Quartermain movies, uh, they were not very good. They were complete B-movie knockoffs of Raiders. I would watch Raiders again before I watch this once. Yes. That's what I say. All right, uh, I've got four here that I'm going to go through uh, real quickly. We've got a uh, double feature uh, from Olive, The Dirty Dozen Deadly Mission and The Dirty Dozen Fatal Mission. Uh, both of these with Telly Savalas and Ernest Borgnine. Neither of these are really uh, up to snuff with The Dirty Dozen. Um, both of these d- directed by Lee Katzen and rather shamelessly attempting to uh, you know, keep the resurrect, we should perhaps say, the, the whole Dirty Dozen concept in the late 80s. Um, this is, you know, a couple of, couple of. I mean, look, this is, it's just truly, truly silly stuff. And uh, these movies never should have existed, but they, you know, they're, they're there now as a double feature. And the only good thing that I can say is that the second film has Eric Estrada in it. Nice. And seeing Eric Estrada in anything always makes me uh, happy. You know, Eric Estrada. I watch those late night infomercials where he's hawking, uh, you know, the, uh, the 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 those homes, those like uh, that you buy out in like Tennessee. You buy like a, a house, right. and some, some some riverfront property or whatever, right. lakefront property by the reservoir. He's always hawking that stuff to sell to old people who are retiring. And I was, no I was, idea. I was ripping people. I watch off. those. I just think that is just really awesome. Uh, you know, uh, behind enemy lines. Not the Owen Wilson film, but the uh, this is the Mark Griffiths film from 1997. This is a really misguided Orion effort uh, with Thomas Ian Griffith, who was never much of an actor. He was much more of a martial artist. Uh, but anyway, he's uh, you know he he's basically a soldier who falls behind enemy lines, and you know you get the whole usual uh, gotta rescue him deal. Uh, this is I, I I assume Olive picked that up because it didn't cost him anything, but it's not a great film. And here's a couple. This cracks me up, Mark. Um, 
exact same artwork, right? Check that out. Isn't that hilarious? The that's fa- not the first time that's been done. I know, but it's funny because they're both coming out the same week from Olive. And it's people, I, I, in, it's people, uh, poor people in a barrel. Poor people in a barrel. Wearing a barrel. Uh, in one of them, it is Susan St. James, Jane Curtin, and Jessica Lang all together in one really big barrel. And that's kind of fetching looking. That's How to Beat the High Cost of Living, uh, which was uh, directed by the one and only Robert Shearer. And uh, all features a very funny turn by uh, Fred Willard. This is a Sam Arkoff film from uh, 1980, one of Sam Arkoff's last sort of you know real good shots at doing something. Anyway, um, this is just about three women whose marriages and lives are falling apart, and they decide to pull off a heist. There you go. But it's a funny trio of ladies, Susan St. James, Jane Curtin, and Jessica Lang, and they do well, and it's, it's, it's fair enough. Uh, the other one that shows people in a barrel is Bob Hope and Lucille Ball in The Facts of Life. Uh, a Melvin Frank film that should be funnier than it is. It's not as funny as you would hope it is with those two people. Uh, 1960, you know, they were both kind of at the end, tail end of their careers. But uh, it, it still has a certain amount of charm. And, you know, there are a couple of people who uh, go on a, on a group trip without their spouses and uh, find themselves sort of falling subject to the Acapulco sun. And it just starts to woo them. You know, it's Bob Hope and Lucille Ball. Speaking of Bob Hope and Lucille Ball, we have a Roy Scheider. I don't know what that means. <laughs> Roy Scheider was one of my favorite. I, not the one of my favorite, but I always liked seeing Roy Scheider in something. I always thought he was cool. Uh, he started an Oscar winning Best Picture, of course, French Connection, and a super cool movie that just came out on Blu-ray a few months ago, Sorcerer. Uh, this is not one of his better efforts. This is a little uh, kind of a, a little serial killer thriller called uh, Night Game. And get this, Scheider plays a, uh, he plays a uh, detective in Galveston, and uh, he notices that there's a serial killer killing people, uh, and it all has to do with night games at the Astrodome. So if there's a oh. night game at the Astrodome, something bad is going to go down, Wade. I know. And that is about as, that's really all you need to know to realize that this thing is really stupid. I don't know what possibly made him want to do this. Uh, it co-stars nobody we've heard of, except maybe Paul Gleason. Uh, directed by nobody we've heard of, written by nobody we've heard of, and really stupid. So I would pass on uh, Night Game. All of films again. We love all of films. They they really rescue a lot of stuff from the from the uh, from the dustbin of history. But Night Game is not one of them. Uh, I got another Olive here, uh, as well as three from Arrow, which are all kind of culty movies. Uh, the Beat Generation is a real cult popularity uh, film, 1959. And it deals with, you know, beatniks and, and uh, beat poetry and everything, all things beat, which sort of transitioned the late 50s into the early 60s. We go from beatniks to hippies rather easily, uh, culturally speaking. Uh, anyway, there's not a lot here to make this interesting other than the fact that you, you have uh, some, you know, Louis Armstrong and his all-stars show up and really play some great music. But uh, other than that, it's just more of a curiosity than anything else. Uh, a little bit more interesting from Arrow are three that Arrow is releasing through uh, MVD. And these are DVD and Blu-ray combo sets. Uh, one is Meiko Kaji's film Blind Woman's Curse. Uh, Blind Woman's Curse Meiko Mech- Kaji is in the film not, not the director uh, Blind Woman's Curse is uh, really a kind of a fascinating unusual Yakuza film that sort of splits the difference between the, the uh, Kinji Fukusaku Yakuza films which are sort of A-list and the more exploitative fare um, so it's uh, you know Meiko Kaji is, a, is, is pretty great in it and then uh, we also have Mark of the Devil which features uh, the one and only Udo Kier among others, but uh, anything that Udo Kier is in, I am... Uh, and Herbert Lom, by the way. You know, oh, right? from uh, Pink Panther. Yeah, but, but Udo Kier. You, you remember when I interviewed Udo Kier for... Uh, speaking of Mark Sanderson, our friend... Uh, remember uh, when we were all working on uh, his little independent film, The uh, Last oh, Call? That's right. Yes, and Udo was in that. He was in that. He was like the big name in the movie. He was, well, he was... He and, and, and Seymour Cassell were the names. That's true. Seymour yeah, was in it, too. Seymour was in it. And, uh, and an Arquette, Richmond Arquette. It was the Arquette that nobody knows about. His sister's won an Oscar now, so maybe he'll have a bigger career. Anyway, no, do you, you remember, I, I did the interviews for the, uh, for the EPK on that. I did all the, I sat down and interviewed everybody. I interviewed Seymour. I interviewed everybody. Udo was the, was the strangest interview. Because it, just as protocol in that, you sit down and you go, okay, please, for the record, you know, for, for anyone who's going to transcribe this, because very often you transcribe things so that they can, you know, it's press kit protocol. Here, okay, please, you know, say, state and, you know, spell your name. And Udo says, I don't need to say my name. Everyone knows who Udo Kier is. 
<laughs> and, in that, and, and he's sitting there petting a cat. There's like this, this ram, this, this, this shaggy cat that was running around Lacey Street Studios. It's complete stray. And Udo thought it would be really cool to do kind of a Bond villain thing. And one of the PAs went and grabbed the, this poor cat and puts it in Udo's lap. And Udo's holding on to this terrified cat. It was like, weren't you? you, you By the way. And, of course, it left, like, gigantic gobs of fur on him because it's a stray. It's shedding all the time. It was, it was a strange moment in By the my, way, my life. Anyway. Speaking of yes. James Bond villains, did you see the new trailer for Spectre? It's pretty cool. It I is, like it. It is pretty cool. You realize it's bringing the whole quantum I know. Casino Royale That's thing right. full circle. That's They've, right, Kevin McCrory. Yeah, they're figuring it. I, I guarantee you, they had not expected to do that, but now they they're like, oh crap. So how can we take the open threads at the end of the last film and tie it back in with quantum and Casino Royale? Somehow we do this, and somehow they're going to make that work. They better. Uh, they better. Now it's going to feel like James Bond. Yeah. But the, the only danger is that is that 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 stuff, Spectre and whatnot, that's all stuff from the sixties and the seventies. I and they did a great job modernizing Bond, modernizing well, his look. They're going to have. One of it's going to seem a little old now by the, bringing back all these sixties no, and seventies tropes. No, for I you because you're an old man. They're going to have to somehow explain how Quantum now becomes Spectre, and hopefully, Mister White will say, "Yes, yeah, you see, there was a rights dispute." I'm not sure. His name is Kevin. Here's our our main villain's name, McCrory. By the way, when anyway. now when when you saw Christoph Waltz in the trail, were, were you like, "This is going to work," or it's not going to work? You know what? I was pleasantly surprised. I was like, I, my my thought was, it appears, and I hope appearances are everything here. It appears as though whatever has made him so irritating in his last half dozen movies. Uh, it's like they they somehow must have taken him and waterboarded him until he promised to not do that anymore, because because it's a completely different Christoph Waltz. At least it appears to be. Let's hope it's, so. It's like he took it down from eleven, which I didn't think he was it was possible. Right. As long as he doesn't you know flash that weird curvy. You know what he'd be good at? He'd be good as the Joker because he looks like the Joker. You only have Jared Leto. The I new, know the new uh, what's it called? Oh, yeah. yeah, whatever. <laughs> Anyway, Mark of the Devil. Where was I going with that? Uh, anyway, writer-director uh, Michael Armstrong did this. And, uh, you know, it's just uh, it's, it's basically one of those exploitation films that's all about religious fanaticism and, and, and murder and, 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 you know, the occult and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it looks pretty good. And then the last one here from Arrow uh, is Day of Anger, which is one of those great Lee Van Cleef uh, spaghetti westerns that is just, you know... He, Lee Van Cleef doesn't get enough uh, credit. He really doesn't. Uh, it, so he kind of transitioned out of for a few dollars more in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly and made a few more of these films over there, and they're all a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, he's if anybody's going to do kind of a, a, a quasi-Clint Eastwood thing, it was Lee Van Cleef. He's great. Especially love him in Escape from New York, which, by the way... Oh, I can't wait! We just got... Really? Yeah. Can, can you give yeah. it to me? Came a couple of days ago. Can you give it to me? Uh, no. What? You don't well, like well, that movie like I do. Dude, I, 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 will, I will not tell the stories. I will wait a couple of weeks. I will share the stories when Can you show it to me? Can you show me the Blu-ray? I will show it to you as soon can as Can you just like hold it up so I can like I smell will, it? I can I will, sniff it? I will rub it all over your naked carcass. <laughs> carcass? That's what I will do. So I have to die in order to uh, even see hey, it? Hey, you know, uh, words mean what they mean. All right. Uh, so anyway, Day of Anger, really good spaghetti western with uh, Lee Van Cleef. DVD and Blu-ray, by the way. Yes. Wait, we have an interesting film from uh, 1954. We have the Shanghai Story. Shanghai Story is kind of like a kinda like a grand hotel type story where you get a bunch of uh, people in an enclosed uh, situation. They have to live live together and figure out uh, who done it. It's with Edmund O'Brien plays a um, plays a surgeon, and Ruth Roman plays a uh, I forgot who she played actually in the movie. But she plays a Greek. Uh, she plays Ruth a, Roman plays a Greek. No, no, she was, she she was from like Tangier in the film. Anyway, so they all have to uh, they're all holed up along with a bunch of other Americans at the Waldorf uh, Hotel. Oh, poor them. <laughs> no, it's not a good thing. It's a bad thing. Is it takes because they're all under the under the uh, uh, the armed and dangerous. Uh, what do they call it? the armed and dangerous guard of the uh, Chinese uh, communist Chinese government? That's a bad thing. I see. So anyway, so they're all together, 
And uh, there's an intelligence agent involved. There's a small-time criminal involved. By the way, played by Richard Jekyll, who's cool. So young looking then. Um, so it's interesting. It's a, bit, it's, a, it's a bit of a spy story. It's a bit of a Grand Hotel type uh, closed quarters thing. And uh, it's cool. It's from 1954, um, directed by Frank Lloyd. So uh, it's definitely worth checking out if you're into such movies. We also have another movie that I cannot recommend uh, called The Quiet Gun. I can't recommend any movie starring Forrest Tucker. Oh, Why? Because he, because it's it, an F troop. Yeah, that's and, that's the, and the original Ghostbusters. The only, th- the only thing I did like about this film is that it has Lee Van Cleef, so young looking. I mean, this film's from 1957. Has Lee Van Cleef, so young looking, and yet he's in full Lee Van Cleef Western villain mode. He's got the hat. He's got the black leather. He's awesome. He wants to steal a herd of, a herd of cattle, and uh, Forrest Tucker plays the sheriff who's going to stop him. It's called The Quiet Gun. There you go. Two films. Uh, one film I can't recommend at all, and the other one, uh, Shanghai uh, Story, uh, is uh, pretty cool. All right, and we got a bunch of Twilight do, do Times, too. Like, big movies this week? Yes, the, we do. We're we the got, big we got movies this week, Ray. We are almost an hour into the show. We've heard nothing big. Go. Okay, let me get through these Twilight Times, and then we'll do the, do the big movies. Uh, Twilight Time at ScreenArchives.com is where you get these, and these are all fantastic Blu-rays. Uh, wonderful, wonderful uh, Ray Harryhausen work in the H.G. Uh, Wells' First Men in the Moon on Blu-ray. Finally, looks really good. Again, these are out in 3,000 uh, set. The only 3,000 DVDs, uh, Blu-rays are pressed, and, they, and that's it, and then it's done. So First Man in the Moon, uh, really a lot of fun. Very, very faithful to the book. And, of course, you get the usual isolated score track, a, uh, a really cool audio commentary with Ray Harryhausen and uh, William Randolph Cook, or, or, or Randall William Cook, who did the, uh, the effects, and trailers and featurettes. It's a lot of fun. It's really good. Uh, and, and boy, I'll tell you, some Twilight, Zone, Twilight Time stuff that's coming out next month, holy cow. Holy cow. Why don't you tell us? Uh, remains of the Day. What? Remains of the Day. Why is that not... Why did, why did Paramount not... Uh, it, Colum- Columbia. That? I mean, Columbia not I, I don't that? know. I don't know. But we're getting a Blu-ray of Remains of the Day. And, and you know what else we're getting? Star Wars. Zardoz. <laughs> Zardoz, baby. Come on! Terrible. Zardoz. No, the only, the only thing you need to know about Zardoz is the one sheet. Oh, that tells you everything you need to know with Sean Connery in his best. little ripped, you know, chest exposing. Oh, ugh, with, his, with, his little, with his little loincloth-y cod uh, Oh, it's the best. That's one of the greatest bad movies ever made. Uh, and then as long as we move from H.G. Wells, we're going to stay in the, uh, in the old steampunk literary tradition of Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. Thank you again, Twilight Time. This is another classic. Uh, from 1959, and uh, directed by Henry Levin, rather stylishly, a lot of fun, beautifully done. James Mason does a very good job, as does everyone else. And uh, Charles Brackett co-wrote the screenplay. Did you know that? Yeah, he, used to, he worked a lot with, uh, Billy what's Wilder. his name? Billy Wilder. The guy who does movies. Yeah. Uh, Solomon and Sheba, a, uh, a, a, just a, a really good, solid, middling, uh, biblical uh, uh Biblical adaptation film from 1959. Yul Brenner was uh, was fresh off of his success in the uh, Ten Commandments, so they threw some fake hair on him and a little facial hair and uh, let him play Solomon. And uh, it's pretty great. Uh, it's not brilliant or anything, but it's it's decent. And uh, what I didn't know was that Tyrone Power was originally supposed to play that part. And you know what, Yul Brenner, much better. Uh, let's see. I'll save the best for last. U turn. Which is a you know an Oliver, one of the few Oliver Stone films that I really uh, unreservedly like a lot. Did you know that? I didn't I re- think that was possible. I really like U Turn. I really really do, and uh, I, I think it's just it was a you know John Ridley really hit and miss you know with his with his his novels and his screenplays. I mean he can do great Twelve Years a Slave, and he could also do you know lame like uh, whatever the, whatever that other film that what was the Lucas produced thing about all the uh, oh the uh, the airmen the, oh uh, gosh that was dreadful so but here you know what this this is a just completely bizarre fish out of watery kind of after hours thing Sean Penn not usually a comedy guy uh, you know I mean he did Fast Times and then everything else was pretty serious after that Sean Penn is hilarious here it's just caught in the weirdest town of all time let me tell you despite the little psychedelic uh, 8 millimeter montage sequence in the middle of this thing uh, Jennifer Lopez by the way topless for those who, who care uh, the, the, honestly Billy Bob Thornton all filthy and disgusting all mechanicked out and doing his filthy disgusting half naked twister one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a movie ever 
Billy Bob Thornton in this is brilliant. That says Absolutely. a lot. Oh, it's so funny. And then lastly from the, uh, the Twilight Time uh, batch is something I cannot speak highly about enough. We don't have a lot of time left, so I will make this as, as, uh, as expeditious as I can. The Bounty, the roadshow version of The Bounty. Now, mind you, The Bounty came out at a time when there were no more roadshow versions of movies. It just it, it didn't happen anymore. 1984, roadshow era basically ended in the early 70s. So here you have a decade later a film suddenly that has a roadshow version and an overture, Mark. Ooh, an overture. Ooh, I love that. The Vangelis score for this has an overture. Now, here's the story of the bounty, in case nobody knows. Uh, David Lean, during the 1970s, after he made Ryan's Daughter, which was very poorly received, which is unfortunate, because um, it's brilliant, and before he made uh, uh, the um, uh, Ian Forster adaptation of Passage to India, uh, he took about a, a, you know, there's about a 12, 13-year space there that he took off from making movies. And he was trying at one point to make a two-film story of Mutiny on the Bounty, going back to the original literary source material, make a big two-part epic, wanted Christopher Reeve to play the, uh, to play the part of Fletcher Christian, wanted, uh, I think, Oliver Reed to play Captain Bly. I mean, it really, you know, it was, it, it, we, we had the, obviously, the Clark Gable version, and then in the late 60s you have the uh, Marlon Brando version. This was going to be the one to end them all. It was going to be the mother of them all. And it, it, it never happened because of all kinds of shenanigans from the, um, from the De Laurentiis family. They were the ones who were going to produce it, and obviously it was more important for them to do things like King Kong and whatever else, and Dune. But uh, anyway, what finally, finally happened was it became one film, and it fell to Roger Donaldson, and it's you know still using the original Robert Bolt screenplay material, uh, but severely truncated, not as good as the lean film would surely have been, but still a really good film in its own right, and one of Roger Donaldson's best, I think. Uh, Mel Gibson is fantastic as Fletcher Christian, and Anthony Hopkins is amazing as Captain Bly. I love this film, uh, the Vangelis music. I'm a big Vangelis fan, love the music, and I'm so thrilled that this is out on Blu-ray at long last. Great audio commentary with a uh, historical consultant, uh, Stephen Walters, and uh, the obvious isolated score track, and another audio commentary with Roger Donaldson, uh, producer Bernard Williams, and production designer John Graysmark. Uh, I just, I'm so thrilled that this is out. So the bounty on Blu-ray... Thank you, Twilight Time, for making my dreams come true. They make my dreams come true, Mark. You making my dreams come true. All right. Hall of Notes. Yes, I know. Okay, so uh, newish movies. Uh, you know, real, here I, I'll, I'll throw this one out there real quickly because it stinks. Uh, song one with Anne Hathaway and Johnny Flynn. Uh, really unfortunate. This could and should have been a better movie. Um, uh, Anne Hathaway should be parlaying her Oscar into better things. Anyway, she basically plays this, uh, uh, you know, a uh, uh, kind of like an archaeologist who comes home when her, her, an accident has struck her brother, and he's in a coma. And uh, to try to awaken him, you know, he was a musician trying to make it as a songwriter. She there's this there's this singer songwriter that he was um, you know obsessed with, and she goes to try to get him to sing songs to her brother in the hospital to wake him out of his coma, and they wind up falling in love, and it it just feels like a really kind of uh, flat uh, melodrama. It uh, never really rings true, but everyone tries hard, so I, I will give them credit for trying hard. Written and directed by Kate Barker Froyland. It's not going to derail her career, but she really ought to do something better next time. Uh, speaking of doing something better next time, we have Jason Statham, who never does anything good ever. Sorry. Here we have his latest wild card. This is based on an old uh, Burt Reynolds film, actually. And, uh, oh, Statham- is it really? Yes. This is based on a Burt Reynolds film? Oh, yeah. From, uh, I think from like the 70s, like the, uh, no, maybe the 80s, late 80s. Um, Statham plays a uh, bodyguard in Las Vegas, and uh, he he helps a friend get revenge on the guy who beat him up, only to find out that the guy who beat him up is the son of a mob boss. Oh, my God. Yep. You know what that means? That means lots of slow motion punching. Yep. That's what that means, because that's all Jason Statham does, and he really has to just stop it. Just do something, anything, please. Just can you please just not make the same film over and over and over again? That's all he's got in him. Even though this is directed by Simon West, Simon West is um, one of the least egregious of the action specialists. I guess that's the best way to say it. Um, he directed uh, the Expendable sequel and the mecha- the remake of the Mechanic. Um, 
General's daughter, Con Air. So he, he, he can direct, but I just think Statham is just, the guy's just DOA to me. I just think he's nothing. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Has Jason Alexander in it, though, speaking of Oh, that's Seinfeld. good. Yeah. Well, he's, he's got a new career doing movies like this, right? <laughs> All right, whatever. Um, uh, let's see. Unbroken. Angelina Jolie uh, in her, her much touted directing debut, which got like almost no Oscar nominations. Uh, everybody kind of expected this to be a big Oscar contender. And, uh, it, it, this it, thing really just. It, it's, it was a black hole of just. It, it was just bizarre. It's too bad because it's not a bad film. It's actually a really well done film. It's a well, look, it, it, it's, it's a film that is well made with the best of intentions. I think the problem is that I think that she, first of all, I think that she is too in love with this guy. I I don't think she ever took the fifty thousand foot view on it. Yeah. I just think that all she wanted to do was just beat this guy up mercilessly for two hours, thinking that we would love him. It, it well it, that that gets to my problem with it, and I don't. I should say I like the film a lot. I think it's beautifully made. I think it's really well acted. I think it's it's this amazing labor of love. You know, producer John Jashney, who who you know friends of mine have had dealings with. He really put a decade of his life into getting this off the ground. And I, and I salute him for it because it is an amazing story. I mean, you know, Zamperini, Louis Zamperini, who was this, you know, champion runner, and then he became a, you know, he's a prisoner of war for all these years. I mean, there's, you know, out here in Torrance, there's an airport named after him, right? A private airport. He's a, he is a legendary figure, and he became really an amazing philanthropist later in life. And this is, of course, the story of his amazing survival at sea and then, you know, survival as a Japanese prisoner of war after his plane was down. Um, and it's it's made like an old fashioned World War II POW movie. I mean, it feels like the you know the, the it, great, yeah, but it's it not, has the sheen of the Great Escape. It's and, not and the, the bridge over the river Kwai, where he and that well, the, the Japanese this is, captor. And this is the this is the re, this is the problem. I think you you hinted at it. I'm going to try to zero in on it, which is that he's not in any way proactive in this movie. Everyone, in, for example, in, everyone in the Great Escape is trying to escape. Uh, in the bridge of the river Kwai, William Holden does escape, and then he has to go back. And while he's in the prisoner in the POW camp in Prisoner of the River Kwai, you you have uh, Alec Guinness who's trying to make the best of the situation, trying to manipulate the situation. These are all proactive characters. All Zamperini does here is hang on for dear life. That's really all he does. He just survives, and and that is dramatically compelling. I mean, but at two hours and eighteen minutes, which is almost as long as Bridge in the River Kwai, at a certain point you do start to say, I wish this guy would do something other than just hang on. Are you going to try to escape? Are you going to try to redeem the Japanese guy who's torturing you? Are you, what's, I mean, are you not, are you literally just going to wait it out? And he does. That's really all he does. He just waits it out. He just guts it out, which makes him inspiring, but it doesn't necessarily make his story as dramatic as it should be. So there's my film critic two bits on it. Nice. On the other end of the spectrum, are we doing all those? No. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to whittle this down. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, in that case, I'm going to kiss these off. From Chef Factor, we have Coffee Town. Coffee Town is the first film from uh, folks over at College Humor. Uh, this is about a bunch of guys who uh, hang out at a coffee shop and, uh, and, uh, and work. Um, you know, it starts out okay, but then it just becomes ridiculous. Maybe because I'm not 18 to 24 anymore. Um, I just did not think this. I think this thing was just really unfunny for really long stretches. And uh, not that the comic actors can't do better when they maybe grow up a little bit. Maybe get a little more seasoning to them, but otherwise, everybody here just did not really do it for me. So I think this thing is a waste. And next we have Banksters, which is about a bunch of uh, college, college graduates who get a job at an investment bank. And they uh, discover all sorts of uh, chicanery with their boss. By the way, the boss, Alan Thicke. So right there you know. Oh, didn't his son just lose a really big court case? Actually, you know, I did a pilot with Alan Thicke. Did you really? I did. I worked with Alan Thicke for a couple months. This is like 20 years ago. Anyway, this thing is just stupid. Goodbye. I mean, come on. It's Banksters. It's, it's okay. No, it's, it's not. okay. No, it's yeah, not. it's okay. It's okay. Alan, Alan, Alan Thicke is uh, no, he's a little Stop long it. in the tooth. but Stop it. Okay. What, what movie with Alan Thicke is going to be good? Well, I just like, you know, I like his commercials these days. Commercials? He does commercials. Haven't you heard any of his, his audio, his commercials? I don't you think haven't? so. He just does commercials. Uh, Hugh Grant and Marissa Tomei, who deserve a better movie than the rewrite, but I understand why they did, why they did it. It's, uh, and J.K. Simmons, frankly, who, of course, did this before he won his Oscar. Uh, a lot of good talent in here, and, and frankly, Mark Lawrence is a, is a good writer-director, 
Uh, I, he I, and Hugh Grant have a history. They they go back because Mark Lawrence did a lot of writing for romantic comedies. Yeah, back in uh, in uh, Hugh Grant's salad days. Uh, it ju- it just feels like they like everybody needed to sort of let this thing percolate another six or seven months. You know, like do a few more rewrites. Maybe I don't know. It just it does. It feels like like it more more idea than than execution. I, it just, you're saying the rewrite needed a rewrite. I, I think the rewrite really needed a rewrite, to be honest. Yes, I do, absolutely. Uh, anyway, the idea here is that, that um, Hugh Grant is a screenwriter, and uh, his, you know, he, he's kind of finding himself falling into, you know, he's got, he's, he owes a lot of money, and his life isn't really working out the way that he, th- he, he thought it should. And he gets a, a job teaching screenwriting in a college in New York, and uh, suddenly he you know, winds up falling in love with a student. That's it. It's, that's the thing. And, I, you know, I, it, gosh, it's, I just want, I want them, I love Hugh Grant, and I love Marissa Tomei, and I just, I love J.K. Simmons. I just want them to do something better. Anyway. All right, that is, uh, you know, we'll save this for next week. So we've got more goodies to talk about. All right, uh, Mark. Uh, yes, sir. We're, we're, we're done for this week. We'll be coming back next week. Your, your instructions this week, um, Find someone interesting to talk about. I want. I want. I want a celebrity sighting for next week. That is a celebrity the, sighting. I want a celebrity sighting? Go track something. I'll, I'll have to make. I'll, well, I'll tell you what. I'll make one up. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> okay. It works for me. Wow, something okay. to look forward to. Okay, there you go. 